Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for iOS Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Get the tools to be as productive as Mike Hurley and learn how to read Reddit. Also, we will discuss GateGate and all the hubbub over complaining about Apple's new iPhone 7. All that and a whole lot more coming up on iOS Today. This episode of iOS Today is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you fresh, high-quality ingredients to cook delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. And by Gazelle, the online marketplace for buying and selling used gadgets. Shop from a variety of certified pre-owned electronics or trade one in for cash. Give a new life to a used device. Visit gazelle.com today. Hello and welcome to iOS Today. This is a show where we talk about iPhones and iPads and Apple Watches and Apple TVs and Leo Laporte. We talk about him usually when he's here and when he's not here. He's not here this week, but I have joining me Mike Hurley from Relay FM. Welcome, Mike. Hey, Megan. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for coming on. So some people might know you as I, Mike. Um, others might uh, know you as the man who uncovered the capacitive glove gate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, I did, I did do that. I did do that. You also host a plethora of podcasts on Relay FM. Um, I love listening to you. Uh, tell, tell us a few uh, about a few of the podcasts that you host. I guess for people that are uh, interested in this show, they might like uh, Upgrade, which is a show that I do with Jason Snell, Six Colors, and we talk about all of this kind of stuff. Uh, Connected as well. Uh, with Federico Vaticci and my co-founder at Relay FM, Stephen Hackett, who actually, a uh, day after I discovered Glovegate, he discovered his gate. Uh, <laughs> so we're all about gates right now at Relay FM. <laughs> yeah, it was just one thing after the other. I loved listening uh, to Connected when you guys were talking about that. Like you thought Capacitive Glovegate was a big deal, but you know you mm -hmm. hadn't heard of his gate yet. So. <laughs> no. Literally haven't heard it yet. <laughs> yes. Well, so far, my new iPhone 7 is not hissing, um, as far mm -hmm. as I can tell. I mean, Stephen said that you could really hear it on, you know, on, when it was like far away from you on the counter. It yeah. wasn't something that you had to just hold up to your ear and, you know, put a, an, you know, an earbud in the other ear to hear. Um, it was really no, he hissing. definitely had a faulty phone. Like his phone was 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 bad. Like I, I could, when uh, it was on the first day, kind of setting up and churning through the photos and stuff, if I put it right up to my ear, I could hear it. But his was like, he could hear it across the other side of the room. There was something wrong with that phone. And did he get a new one? I think, yeah, he did actually. Yeah, he, yesterday, Apple, Apple Care gave him a call, I think, and sent him to his store to pick up a new one. Oh. So Apple Care have sorted him out. They fixed him up. That is nice. Yeah, and I guess even if you're not Stephen Hackett, you could still get a new phone. You don't have to talk about it on the podcast and get, you know, no. however million uh, hits on YouTube on your video. They will return it for you, right? No, I think they, they sorted him out because he called first, like before he even published the video. He called up Apple support and they wanted to get him sorted that day, but there was just no stock in his store. Well, we both have the iPhone 7 Plus. Do you have a 7 II mm -hmm. or just the Plus? Always the plus. I'm a, I'm a happy member of the plus club. I have been since the six. I, I went straight in. As soon as they announced that big size, I knew it was for me. Well, I, I had the six and then I went for the 6S plus and I liked it, but I had thought I was going to go back to the seven, just to the smaller version. But then mm -hmm. the camera, you, you know, if you want all the features of the new camera, you have to get the plus. Um, you've been playing around with the camera. You posted the most beautiful pictures of BB-8 anyone has ever seen <laughs> <laughs> on Twitter. Uh, and then you even, I, I think we have a picture from your Instagram from a night picture that you took. That I assume yeah. is with the 7 Plus. That's beautiful. Yes, and with the 2X zoom. So I was standing, so that's on the Thames, it's obviously uh, the Tower of London. I was on the other side of the river, river when I took that photo. And I wanted to post it because I could never have taken that photo before. With, with the previous camera, with just the standard 1X one, one zoom, I would never zoom in because it just didn't look very good trying to use software zoom. 
And I was just so impressed that I was able to get that from all the way over standing on the other side of the River Thames. It was, uh, that was just one of those things where I was like, yeah, I really made the right choice with this phone. Yeah, I know you can't, it's like you can't take credit for it anymore, but it is beautiful. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you took the photo. So that's the 2X, that's the optical zoom or the digital zoom? The optical. Okay. So yeah, I mean, let's talk a little bit about that. I, I took a picture, um, I don't know, Brian, if I, uh, I posted it on Twitter uh, yesterday or the day before. I used the 10X, so that's the digital zoom, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, after after the two X, it goes to digital. Okay, and but, up to the up to the two X is the optical. But I was I was still amazed. It was you know in my yard, and I took a picture of you know from far away the barn. There it is, um, and then and then I did the ten X digital zoom. And it's, I mean, I couldn't believe it's never, I mean, I've taken that yeah, picture a lot. Crazy. Like, yeah, cause there's like a lot, usually there's like hawks and birds and stuff that I try to photograph in those trees back there um, when I'm on my porch and they, and I can never get them. They're all blurry, but I just, it's, it's crazy that it's mm -hmm. so good. It's like, you know, the quality is, is not the best, right? When it goes to that level, mm -hmm. but that's kind of not the point. Just look how far away that barn is, you yeah. know, and you were able to get it. It's, it's kind of amazing. I think so. And so what about the sound? We got an email um, from Jacob, Jacob Siegel. He writes, I've noticed a significant improvement in sound fidelity since the six, though I'm guessing that this will be, there will be a lot of skepticism, but I found that I've not really needed to use the earbox headphones. I also really love the speakers. I just wanted to know your opinion coming from the six, since I don't know anyone else with a seven plus yet. Um, or the seven. So, I mean, I, I will show you that I got my phone on Saturday and the earbuds and the dongle are still in the box. I haven't even taken them out. Um, mostly because I listen to Bluetooth headphones. But yeah, I mean, so this is, if you haven't seen that, this is the um, connector, just the regular connector. And then the, oh, the dongle is here, the tiny little dongle. Um, and here are the ear pods, not the AirPods, but the EarPods, they're connected in here. Have you used the EarPods a lot? Yeah. Uh, I mean, this was the thing with the, with the removal of the headphone jack is about 95% of the time that I use any type of headphones, I'm using the included Apple EarPods. They've always done a decent job for me. They stay in my ears. They've got the clicker on them. They're fine. And so with me changing over to the lightning connector, it didn't make too much of a difference in my life. There will be times where I'll need some kind of dongle, like when I'm on a plane and I want bigger headphones and I want to be able to charge and stuff. Like I get all of that. I'm just going to have to deal with it when time comes or I'll start looking into some pretty decent Bluetooth headphones. I'm going to try out the AirPods when they come out because I really want to see if they're everything Apple have kind of cracked them up to be. But in regards to, to Jacob's question, if, if he's meaning with the speakers... Yes, the stereo speakers have made an incredible improvement to the, 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 the level of the audio and also the quality as well. You know, I, I love listening to podcasts when I'm at home on my iPad Pro because the, the four speakers on that thing is just amazing. Mm -hmm. But now it's way better, it's way louder with the stereo speakers on the iPhone now. Um, and with the, the, the lightning headphones, I think think I can hear a little bit of a difference. Like it feels like it's a little bit better, but I'm not sure if that's just something tricking me in my brain to make me think that's the case. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I don't know either. I'm not a, enough of a sound expert, but yes, Martin in Europe was asking if they came with wired headphones and they do. Um, they are lightning. They're not, you know, they're, they're not, mm -hmm. they, they didn't send along the ones with the auxiliary. So, so I think, yeah, some people are confused by this because especially because the lightning headphones are connected to the dongle, which implies you'll need the dongle for these but you don't. <laughs> yeah, the packaging on that is strange because that little dongle is kind of just hidden away in there. And like mm -hmm. the first time you take it out, it's like, what? What's happening? <laughs> it's, it's strange, but it's, it's cute little packaging that they've got there. And in all honesty, um, it really surprised me when Apple said that they were going to include that dongle. Uh, it's a very kind of un Apple move because they're kind of admitting that the phone isn't 100% ready to, to drop the headphone jack yet, right? By including the dongle, it's a kind of an admission of the fact that you might actually need this. Um, so it was surprising, but I think for customers, it's a good thing because if you've invested some money in some really nice headphones, you now have a dongle that you can still use them with. And it also surprises me that they're, for Apple adapters sake, cheap, they're like nine bucks. So you could just buy a few of them and just attach them to the headphones and just leave them there, you know? And then they're always there. They're always ready when you need them. 
Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm going to do because, I mean, I don't have a pair of headphones that I listen to that aren't Bluetooth, um, but mm -hmm. I do in one of the, our cars, we have an auxiliary that we don't have Bluetooth. It's a 2006 car and we um, use, you know, an auxiliary cable. And I got into the car mm -hmm. the other day and I, I did this and like <laughs> I was not paying attention. I was like, why isn't it working? <laughs> and then I realized like, oh, there's no auxiliary jack. And that's something I've been talking about every day at work for the last you know, three months. <laughs> I still forgot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not surprised. It was, it, it's still weird for me every time I plug those ear pods in. It's like, this is going in the wrong place. When I would, it's, it's a strange feeling. It's just weird to plug headphones in to the lightning bolt. Um, so some of the other purchases I made, I got, uh, we were talking about our cases before we uh, started the show, but I got the leather case. This is the midnight blue leather case. Um, it's $49 um, and it's for the seven. That's why my other cases didn't work. They cover up the camera, which is such a pain because then you have to take uh, them off in order to shoot pictures. Unless you're, you, I mean, I guess some, case, some cases for the 6S were big enough, but mine wasn't. But I really like this case. It feels good. And I really wanted a blue iPhone. And now, um, now I have sort of a blue iPhone. Underneath is the matte black, not the glossy black. So I'll show that off to you. Um, what case did you get? So I went with uh, the ocean blue um, and I went with the silicone cases. I've been using the silicone cases for a couple of years because the plus is so large, any additional grip that I can get is a good thing. Um, and I find, I think it differs from person to person, but I find the silicone to be the grippiest. Some people say that the leather is grippier for them, but this works really well for me. And typically, the silicone cases have come in really bright colors. Now, since the Apple Watch came around, Apple have been changing out the colors of their cases more frequently because they're doing them seasonally to match the sport bands that they release. Um, so like on the, 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 the 6S Plus, I had a bright orange case that I loved a lot. Um, but now I've got the blue one and I like it. I've got the gold phone um, and I like the way that the gold and the blue kind of match up together. I think it's quite a nice, nice little pairing. Um, and I went gold because there were no black models available in the UK. Because um, I, I was going to go for the matte black uh, because it was new. The jet black isn't for me. I, I can see why people like that look, but that, that's not my style. But uh, I have a gold iPad and I love the little gold accents. So I was pretty happy to pick up the, the, the gold of the iPhone as well. Yeah, and I mean, I, I like the black front too. Yours is the, the gold is the white front, right? Uh, like yeah, this. the white yeah. front. Yeah, the rose gold was the white front too. I don't know what I like about the black front, but um, the other thing that I purchased, which was also $49, is this little thing that I posted on uh, Twitter and many people made fun of me for paying $49 for this. Uh, this allows you with your uh, headphones to charge uh, and listen to your uh, auxiliary, your your headphone jack at the same time. So it has a headphone jack there and this is the lightning that you charge it. So you can charge your phone and listen at the same time. Um, and it, I think it costs a lot. I think if you want the white plastic, it's only 39, this was 49. I mean, mm. what I just found was with the case on it, it's kind of, it's not that stable. It sort of falls over a little bit. So I don't know, I might be returning it. How do yeah, you Yeah, I'm plan? not a big fan of those docks. Yeah, you don't think much of them? No, no. <laughs> I, uh, I, I use a doc that's made by some friends of mine, a company called Studio Neat. Um, they're, they're responsible for an iPhone kind of uh, camera mount called the Glyph, which you may have heard of. They just made a product called the Material Doc, uh, which I really love. It's made of like wood and cork, and you can put iPhone cables in there and Apple Watch cables in there, so you can charge them both as well. They have an iPhone one or an iPhone and watch one. Um, so I kind of have this sitting on my desk now, and they put this like, um, this, I can't think of the term, but like this like grip on the bottom of it. Oh, so it doesn't stick, but you can put it down on the desk and it kind of holds its position. Like it's not stuck there, but it's this kind of like sticky kind of grippy, like lining on the bottom of it. And then you can take your phone out really easily with just one hand. That's it, micro suction, they call it. So it doesn't stick to it like with glue but it's this weird kind of like suction material. So I really love this thing. I will say they're friends of mine, but uh, they make great products and I thoroughly endorse this. I've got it sitting on my nightstand. Oh, so that one is, do you have the one that connect, that's just one base for watch and phone? Yeah, it's oh, one base, really nice. watch and phone. Yeah. I have the Belkin watch and phone charger and it is metal. Um, I like the wood better and it also takes up a yep. little more space. 
Um, and I, I take it with me when I go places. And every time I've gotten, uh, like I've had them have to search through my carry-on bag because it looks like some sort of weapon of some kind or something. Because <laughs> people are like, thing. what is this Apple Watch charger phone? <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, well, um, you have a lot of tools. You're super productive. You do a billion different podcasts and um, you are uh, always on Twitter. And um, so... I wanted to find out what you use on a daily basis to be more productive. Um, so mm -hmm. first, let's start with the Logitech Create for the 9.7. Uh, that's the keyboard case for the smaller iPad Pro. Tell us why you use that. So I, uh, aside from when I'm recording shows and editing shows, all of my work is done on iPads. So all of my email, all my spreadsheet stuff, all of my preparation for shows, I do that on iPads and, and I have a 12.9 and a 9.7. Um, I bought the 12.9 immediately, and then when the 9.7 came out, I thought I'd give it a go. And I kind of fell in love with it because it was most of what I would get out of the larger iPad, but more, even more portable, right? Because the 12.9-inch iPad Pro can be a bit of a beast to get around. But I do use them both every day for different tasks, depending on what I'm doing. And when I saw the uh, Logitech Create 9.7, I wanted to give it a go because it was a backlit keyboard, which was something that I was really looking for. Um, and also it has an integrated pencil holder as well because I use the Apple Pencil a lot. And I thought I'd give it a go. And initially I was a little bit unsure about it because it adds a lot of bulk and weight to the 9.7. But this keyboard, after using it for about a week or so, has turned the 9.7 inch iPad Pro into my favorite computer that I own. The keyboard is really nice. It's a, it feels like a laptop keyboard. You feel like you're typing on a MacBook, which is far superior to what it's like to type on one of the smart cover keyboards, which in and of themselves, they're really good, but this is far better. It has all of the media and iOS dedicated keys, so you can play and pull stuff. You can change the backlighting, you can change the volume, you can go to the home, you can activate search, and it has all those keys on a media row. Um, and I, they really, the backlight's fantastic. Like I, uh, I have been known most nights to be working uh, in bed, when my fiance is sleeping. So having a backlit keyboard is really great for that. <laughs> um, and it's just really nice to have everything just bundled up in this one case. It's a whole case as well. Um, and I've got the pencil in there and I've got a keyboard there and it just makes the iPad Pro an even greater computer than it already is. So I, I know the the uh, iPad, the I, the pencil, the Apple Pencil holder uh, in the 9.7 Logitech Create is an addition that didn't come in the first one. Is that Does the keyboard mm -hmm. actually feel better? Uh, I never actually used the 12.9, um, but I know some people that have used them both and they say that the 9.7 is, is better because the 12.9 isn't backlit. Um, and right. so, yeah, I've heard I've heard from people that have used them both that say that this one is is a better is a better piece of kit. The other thing is the twelve point nine, the the Logitech Create case, it is obviously even heavier, mm -hmm. so it adds more and more weight to it. So it's a less appealing product, really. I think. But I think that Logitech look. learned from it and improved it and made the nine seven better. I agree. Yeah, I have the Create for the bigger um, iPad Pro and. Yeah, I didn't, I mean, because it wasn't out right away. So now I just have the Apple keyboard. And it's not, I mean, it's the, I, I like the actual keys. I like the feel of the mm -hmm. keyboard on um, the Logitech, but I haven't tried the 9.7, but maybe I will. Um, if yeah, I, it is really great. I thoroughly recommend it. Have you ever tried Bridge, the Bridge keyboards for the iPad Pros for any of them? No, I don't think I've heard of those. Um, that It's like B-R-Y uh, Bridge. And I've looked at them. They look really great. I think we might have a link there. You know, they sort of connect. Uh, it looks like a keyboard that's made by Apple. I mean, it looks exactly like it. And then the iPad just sort of fits uh, into it, clamps into it. Now, I've, I've read some reviews that some of them fit better than others. They clamp some, you know, the clamp is a little bit shaky on others. But that's something that I also uh, would like to try out because I just, nothing beats oh, my MacBook keyboard. Yeah. The adjustable viewing angle, that is a big thing. Um, so uh, it looks like these connect by Bluetooth, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, that's one of the things that I really love about the Create is that it connects by the smart connector. So it never needs to be charged. I never need to think about that. Um, and that's one of the other things that makes it a real winner for me is it's just connected by the smart connector. The Bluetooth, oh, sorry, the backlight is uh, powered by the smart connector as well. That's one of the real big selling points of it for me. It's 
one less thing to have to think about charging, one less cable to have to take with me. I know. It's crazy how many things we charge. Like I have a dozen things probably charging at once. <laughs> yeah. It's a nightmare. And, and something is always not charged when I need it. <laughs> this is my uh, concern about Bluetooth yeah. earbuds, right? It's, it's another thing to charge. So I'm wondering to see how that ends up panning out with something like the AirPods. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, let's talk about the Apple Pencil. Um, you know, we all talked about it a bunch when it came out. Um, I find that I don't use mine as often um, as... I should, or, <laughs> but, but you use it a lot. You say, tell us about yeah. what you do with it. I use my Apple Pencil for uh, something that most people wouldn't, right? Like it is intended to be a drawing tool and a note-taking tool. But I very frequently use the Apple Pencil to control iOS. So I will use the Apple Pencil to control UI elements. You know, like I might be tapping out something in, in my calendar application, or I might be tapping around the web or navigating Twitter. I use the pencil for this. It works really great for it. Um, it. It gives you really good control over UI elements when it's zoomed out as well. So I take a look, I use a lot of spreadsheets and Google Sheets. I'm able to zoom out quite far on the spreadsheet and still click in within the cells because it's a finer point than my finger is. Um, and I find it to be really comfortable over long periods of time. On my Mac, for my iMac, I use a Wacom. Um, and I use the Wacom tablet to control the operating system. And I started doing this because of some RSI problems that I was having. And then when the Apple Pencil came out, it was like, oh, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. So as well as using it for notes and sketches, which I do, I far more frequently use it to, as you can see with what you're doing here, Megan, like just to, to, to navigate around iOS. And it works really, really great for that. And I find it to be a good way over a long period of time if I'm sitting down and doing a lot of concentrated work as a way to help me control iOS at a good speed and at a good pace and also with a way to try and make sure that I'm not destroying my hands and wrists at the same time. That's good. I, I never thought about it. Yeah, I think you probably have to, you have to train yourself to, to have it around and to mm -hmm. keep it charged, of course, and to use it. But yeah, so you feel like when you're just you doing hours and hours of work, it's better on your hand than just tapping and yeah, typing? Yeah, I feel so. And I don't know if it, this is the same for everyone, but I know like, you know, there are certain people who have different wrist and, and, and arm problems. Uh, and I have found that when I was using a mouse uh, and a trackpad exclusively on my Mac, I started to have some trouble. And then when I moved to a Wacom tablet with a pen, all of my RSI problems went away. So being able to make sure that I'm keeping my wrists and hands healthy also when using the iPad is a big thing for me. So I was showing off our next app that you recommend that you use, AirMail. Now I had used AirMail in the past, um, but then I don't know why I didn't keep using it, but it wasn't, it just, for some reason, I, I used Outlook and then now I just use mm -hmm. Inbox for Google. That's just uh, what works best for me. Um, so, but what, uh, why do you like to use AirMail? So caveat, AirMail can be a bit tricky in places. Um, it, it is prone to some bugs and, and it's because it tries to do everything. Airmail is without a doubt the most heavily customizable email application that I've used. Like the setting screen on this application is full of every single type of customization option that you may ever want to look for. Um, you can heavily customize notifications. They have their own system of notification priority and stuff like that now where it tries to be smart about it. Um, you can do things like one of my favorite features from an email client, and this is the only one on iOS that does this, is a message is not marked as read until you either reply to it or make some action to it. Opening it doesn't mark it as read. Oh. And that sounds kind of weird, but I have this strange way of dealing with email and that's it. If I don't actually act upon the email, I don't want it to be marked as, as read. So it even has, for people with uh, bonkers things that they want to do with email like me, it has those features in there. Airmail also has some incredible integrations with other applications, and you can set gestures and swipes to do those. So for example, I am an OmniFocus user for my tasks, for my, my getting things done tasks, and I'm able to, with a swipe or from hitting a couple of buttons, take an email, take the contents of that email and send it to OmniFocus and create a new task with that text in the note 
with a link that will take me back to airmail to that exact email. So I can tap the link and it opens it back up again. So this can be useful for things like following up with someone in a week. I just say add to OmniFocus, just say check up in a week. And then when that task pops up in OmniFocus, I have a link that I can click, takes me back into airmail so I can respond to that email. I was it is a download. very, gone. I was going to download yeah. OmniFocus, but it's $40. Is it worth it? OmniFocus is no joke. Yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> it, I, I, uh, for most people, don't recommend OmniFocus because it is, it's a heavy thing to get into. But if you have found yourself using many applications over over the years to try and get your tasks done and you've been unhappy, I then maybe recommend going into OmniFocus. Or if you are a student of the Getting Things Done Method by mm -hmm. David Allen, mm -hmm. OmniFocus is built around that. So it's a good thing. But it is a professional grade application and it's priced as such. Um, but Airmail, I it's I think it's a it's maybe like three bucks or something like that. Mm -hmm. I if you get a lot of email, I recommend it. It takes some time to set up, but once you've done it, it's great. And also the settings that you choose, they all sync over iCloud, um, and it also has a Mac application as well. So it is a great all around email application that if you can master it, which isn't incredibly difficult to do, but if you really kind of master it, get it under control you have a very, very powerful email application at your fingertips. And so you can use it on uh, on your laptop as well. Mm -hmm. So you can use it on your Mac, uh, on your iPhone, or on your iPad. It's completely cross-platform. Apple Watch? It has an Apple Watch app. Yep, it does. Do you use it on everything. the Apple Watch? I don't use the app, but I use the notifications. Mm. So it has great notifications and you can customize the buttons. So I have an archive and a reply, but you can archive delete, you can snooze an email straight from your Apple Watch. So that's another thing, right? Notifications, you can customize even the buttons that it lets you hit in iOS. It's a very, very powerful application. It has 3D touch support for the iPhone, which I love. So you can just peek into an email by squeezing really hard on the screen. Uh, I, it really is a, a very, very good app. And if you tried it before and didn't like it, it's gotten significantly better with updates. So I'd recommend giving it another go. Okay, I will give it another go. So are you saying you can like snooze from your Apple Watch? You can snooze from your Apple Watch. So an email will come in and you see the notification and you can just hit the snooze button and it will snooze it. I cool. uh, I like that. Because that's the thing. I mean, I feel like all I have can do on my Apple Watch is just get notifications. Like I'll, you know, I... I can archive, but then it won't archive actually, you know, in my, it doesn't go over to my email and you can't respond. And now I've taken to, I really like with watch OS three, being able to respond to text messages, you know, by scribbling that works great. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I will try Airmail. You've convinced me. I recommend it. <laughs> okay. And notability, that is another uh, yep. product that I've tried and, and failed to succeed on. Uh, what do you use? Um, Notability, besides scribbling a little note like that, like I did. <laughs> Notability for me is the application that makes a real great pairing between iOS and the Apple Pencil. So Notability is primarily a note-taking application, uh, but I use it for when I'm in meetings or when I'm on conference calls. I will open Notability and use it to take notes. Now, I am a big pen and paper person, I love pen and paper. It's one of my things that, that I love. I even have a podcast dedicated to pen and paper <laughs> called The Pen Addict, if you are so inclined. Uh, but I, with, with things like that are related to my business, I want to be able to take advantage of having those things around wherever I am. And Notability does a great job of iCloud syncing. So I can be taking notes on my iPhone or I could be taking notes on my iPad with my Apple Pencil, and it will be on all of my devices. I can get access to it, which is really, really great. And it has pens, it has highlighters, it has erasers. There's a great cutting tool, so you can just highlight something and just drag it around the page, which is really great. So you can just draw a loop around it and move it around if you maybe want to rearrange something. It's a nice and simple um, application for note-taking, but it does an astoundably good job at what it's doing. It has great Apple Pencil support as well, where they're using um, all of the SDK stuff to recognize the Apple Pencil, and it does a fantastic job with palm rejection. So, for example, if you have the Apple Pencil mode turned on, which you can hit from the pen area, you, you put your finger on the screen, and it doesn't write anything because it knows that what it's looking for is the Apple Pencil. 
So I, I'm really, I find it to be a very impressive, nicely maintained application that has a bunch of different paper types as well. So like it has like specific types of paper for planning and for dates and calendars and stuff. And it's awesome. It's like today um, I was using my 12.9 inch iPad and my Apple Pencil and Notability to do some planning work for next year. And it was just a real joy to have this like huge canvas in front of me. And I had this powerful application and I was able to write everything out. And then you can export everything out. You can send it to uh, Dropbox and stuff like that. You can create PDFs and share them around. It's just a nice, it's a very, it's like on the face of it, a simple application. But that's kind of what makes it great. There are some note-taking apps that are just full of every single feature that you've ever not wanted. But <laughs> Notability <laughs> just it boils it down to like the essentials of what a good note-taking application should be. And it does a great job. But the Apple Pencil is just superb. And Notability is is about three ninety nine. How much was, did we say that? It cost? I think it's I think it's about that, and it's universal as well. So you'll get it on all your devices. So yeah, it's again, it is a it's a more expensive application, um, and it is a paid application. But this is kind of in the theme, right, of getting work done. And if you can find the tools that really work for you, it's worth paying a little bit of money for them. I think. Right. If you're using these for you know for productivity, if you own your own business, you have a podcast, you have a blog, anything like that. Um, yeah, these are, it's worth investing to get more mm -hmm. done faster. Okay, and finally, here's another app that has I have tried, but um, I don't think my brain works the way this app wants it to work. Uh, workflow. How do you use Workflow? So, Workflow is the application that I use to help me do some of the things that are otherwise tricky on the iPad. So it is um, a difficult thing to wrap your head around, like building these workflows. But for someone like me, I, I don't have any coding knowledge. There can be some real, um, once you kind of lock into what it's doing, the idea of dragging and dropping these actions around so you're able to build these like automated scripts, right? Like recipes that will do things on your iOS device. And it isn't, once you kind of really understand what you can do with workflow, it can be incredibly powerful. Like there are workflow actions available that will let you take a YouTube video, a link from a YouTube video, and download the audio from it all on your iOS device and then send it to Dropbox or something so you can listen to it in another application later. Like this sort of stuff exists out there and Workflow have their own uh, inbuilt gallery of workflows that you can choose from and pick from. There are websites that are dedicated to them and just Googling around the web will help you find them. But some of the stuff that I'm able to do, just very simply, I can take a web page and turn it into a PDF using Workflow, which there isn't a, a super easy way to do that on iOS. Um, I can take, say I have some markdown text and I want to send it to somebody in a rich text email. Workflow lets me do that really easily. I just throw the markdown in, it converts it and opens up an email pane because I built that action. Um, or I use Chrome on iOS. So instead of Safari, I use Chrome on the desktop, on the Mac. Um, I've always done that. So I use Chrome because it syncs all of my history and stuff. So I built a workflow which I can trigger from the share sheet from the, with, with an extension that will let me take the current URL and open it in Chrome because sometimes some applications automatically just open a link in Safari. Most applications will do this and they have a setting. But I want to read it in Chrome, which is my browser. So I just hit the share sheet, I hit the workflow, hit the action, and it opens in Chrome. So there's just little things that you're able to take control of and you can do some simple stuff like that. Or you can do some really, really heavy work with workflow and it, you, know, you can start putting your own code into the thing. It is an incredibly powerful tool that you just spend a little bit of time with Spend some time playing around, download some workflows from their gallery, take a look at them, see what they're doing, and it will kind of give you the ability to do some really cool and powerful stuff. So is it, do you use this instead of um, if this, then that, because it's just more, it has, it has more options, or do you use both? The difference is with workflow, workflow is doing things that, a lot of things that are native to the device. So it's able to take control of things on the device, and it does also have and IFTTT integration. So you can start things in workflow, it can trigger an IFTT action, and then bring something back into workflow again. It, it, once you start digging into this thing, it is in kind of incredible what it can do. But there's a, there's a lot of layers here, and you can start at the surface level and do some stuff. Like, 
taking a, a burst, like say you have a burst photo, you've taken like 60 photos in a burst. Mm -hmm. You can like take those and turn them into a GIF. And it's like really easy to just build that stuff on your own. Or you can go to the app store and pay $2 for an app that does that, right? <laughs> like there are ways with workflow to kind of build your own really powerful things. You just kind of got to get into their mindset. Right, that makes sense. That's how you spend uh, thirty nine dollars on that other app because you the you know there was thirty eight apps you just built yourself in workflow. Exactly. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> All right. Well, after uh, we take a break and thank one of our sponsors, we're going to talk about to Mike about some of the gate gate and all the politics around complaining about things in the iPhone 7. Uh, we're also going to answer a couple of questions and talk a little bit more about the new features in iOS 10 and some uh, and we'll also give our favorite apps. But first, I wanted to thank Blue Apron. Blue Apron is the sponsor of iOS today. Each meal comes with a step by step easy to follow recipe card and pre-portioned ingredients that can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. So you can save time and you can save money. Shopping at the grocery store is 60% more expensive than Blue Apron. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. They also support a more sustainable food system. They set the highest standards for ingredients and build a community of home chefs. That's their mission. Blue Apron also has sourced sustainably seafood and beef is all raised humanely. Their chickens are free range, their pork is raised naturally and they use regenerative farming practice for uh, produce. Whether it's Japanese ramen noodles, wild caught Alaskan salmon or heirloom tomatoes, Blue Apron brings you the best. It's also just fun to cook together uh, with your family and your friends. It bring, builds strong bonds and research shows that Blue Apron families cook nearly three times as often. New recipes are created every week by Blue Apron's culinary team. They're not repeated within a year. So you can get eggplant and chickpea tagine with Islander pepper, tomato, and couscous. Summer udon noodle salad and cherry tomatoes, corn and summer sweet pepper and spicy hoisin chicken stir fry with baby bok choy and sesame ginger cucumber salad. So check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twit. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home cooked meals with Blue Apron. So go to blueapron.com slash twit and we thank Blue Apron for their support of iOS today. So I've been calling this gate gate. Maybe others are calling it gate gate as well. Uh, we talked a little bit before about the capacitive gloves, um, mm -hmm. the problem with uh, cloth. T talk a little bit about what you discovered when you uh, first got your iPhone 7 uh, home with what you discovered trying to tap the home button. So the home button on the new iPhones is now capacitive. So you, it has to have some kind of contact with skin is what it's ended up appearing to be. It's, it's, no, it's a solid state home button now. And I was just kind of using my phone as I would normally do. And something that I usually do, I'm, I'm laying in bed and I kind of had the phone rested on my, on my stomach and I was just playing around and I tried to press the home button and it didn't work and I felt nothing. And I looked down and my, I had a, a bit of material from my t-shirt in between my thumb and the home button. I did some tests, tried it out with, through some materials and could see that it wasn't working. So as I usually do with these things, I tweeted about it. Just said, hey, this is weird. The, the home button doesn't seem to work if there's any kind of obstruction to it. Then it kind of exploded a little bit and these things kind of, it, it perpetuated around the web. Some articles got written and got linked to in some places and it ended up becoming a discussion about if gloves can work on the new iPhone. And kind of the, the long and short of the story is if you don't have capacitive gloves, you know, if you have like a regular pair of gloves without any of those capacitive tips in them, it won't work because what, what it seems to be now is that the current home button on the iPhone requires a connection with the touch ID sensor. So the little ring that goes around the, the, the home button needs to have a connection with your skin to recognize some kind of press taking, taking action. Another way you can test this if you want to is if you press your fingernail into the center of the home button, nothing happens because it's not able to kind of get the full connection with your fingertip. Now, whether this is an issue or not is a, is a whole other thing. For most people, probably not. And my feeling when I first spoke about it was like, hey, here's this weird thing. Um, and I do consider it a regression in some ways because it's now not as easy to hit the home button. There are times where the home button 
I go to press it and nothing happens. Like I might hit it with the back of my finger, like I'm doing it right now. I'm, I'm clicking my, my home button with my fingernail and I can't feel anything. And that wasn't the way it was before. That would click the home button. And, you know, people can think of that what they will. I consider it a slight regression. It doesn't make me recommend the phone any less. It's just something to think about. However, there is a whole industry, I believe, built around people trying to discover the biggest problem in the next iPhone. It can be worth a lot of money if you are able to get something up on your website that people start linking to or start searching for. And there is a, you know, there's a whole industry of people that take the phones and try and bend them until they break, right? Like it is a, a thing that exists. So if you are somebody who finds something which is peculiar about the new phone, it will get around quickly is what I discovered. So so what so there's also people who complain about people saying, "Oh, you're just looking for the next thing." Mm -hmm. It's this whole kind of uh, interesting thing that comes around whenever the new phone comes out. It's like, yep. you know, uh, some people saying like, you know, you're just it's just clickbait. I mean, no one was saying that about what you were saying, but you know, there's that Some people were. Some people were. I mean, there I had a lot of people contacting me over Twitter and telling me that I was talking nonsense, which is fine. And I understand that people are very defensive of Apple. Uh, but my kind of feeling on this is I consider myself a journalist. You know, like this is what I do for a living. I look at these devices, I talk about them, I think about them, and I create shows about them talking about what they do. And I noticed something that was weird. And at the time, the only way that I would report on it, if you would call it such a thing, is to tweet about it. And I told the people that followed me about it. And then on the next show that I had, and we, me and Jason then spoke about it on Upgrade. I, in the tweet that I posted, I never said good or bad about it. It was just like, here is this weird thing because this is weird. This isn't normal for us. And there are people that feel like they have to immediately defend Apple for a reason that I don't fully understand. Um, I feel like that they are a company that is open to criticism. They have created a product and there are people that will want to look at this product and want to know if it's the right thing for them. And I think that it's beneficial when there are people that are willing to openly talk about the things that they find wrong with something to give a more balanced and assessed view. So, you know, my view on this phone is there are some really weird things that it does. And there are some things on this phone that are different to any other iPhone, but I still think it's a great product. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting position that we're all in, I think, because, you know, as, as a journalist in the past, like, you know, could you could feel strongly about like a particular political candidate and, you know, then, but you could remain unbiased. You didn't carry that political candidate around in your pocket and use it mm -hmm. every day, all day for your work and, you know, find that it like lets you um, enjoy life better, you know? So we have this weird attachment to these products that, you know, we want to stay unbiased about. But I think there's also, I think some some of that attachment extends to wanting other people to also love these products. So I think there's a, some yeah. people in this community that think like, well, if you tweet about it, Mike, then all these people that don't really understand are not going to buy this iPhone. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you've sort of fooled them because what you're talking about is such a small problem. But what you're saying is that, you know, the faster that we talk about these problems and get them out there, the faster that Apple will fix them. Yeah, if they are to be fixed. You know, there, there is some stuff about the, the headphones not working after a certain period of time that mm -hmm. seems to have been fixed. What This thing with the, the home button, this is just a change in the technology now. I mean, I don't think if there's going to be any change to it in this cycle, maybe they'll change it for the next phone and it will be used in a different way. But this is just the way that it is. I think people would kind of put their own view on it. You know, a lot of the idea of whether this was a good thing or a bad thing was put upon by other people, by other articles that were being written. But this is just kind of the way that it is. This is just the fact of opinions. People have opinions and they will put their own view on it one way or the other. The problem is, and the reason that people react negatively to anyone saying this stuff, is that this industry of people trying to bend phones and break phones and put them in tubs of water to see if they'll die, that all exists. So it can be seen by some people that anyone saying something negative about the iPhone is just trying to drive clickbait traffic to them. Like if I, you know, if what I was looking for was to try and generate some buzz, I would have put it in a show and put the link out there rather than tweeting about it because that tweet doesn't do anything for me. I don't make any money from that tweet, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I would 
put it in a show and release a quick bonus episode of a show talking about this new scandal that I've found. But I, I understand that people that don't know me, they have no idea what I'm doing here. And all I'm trying to do is just talk about the things that I find because I think that Apple, as the largest company in the world, is open to criticism. I agree. Yeah, I think that... Um I think we should be able to say whatever we want. But what you were talking about um, before with the headphones, I mean, that, that is something that got fixed. Who knows if it would have gotten mm -hmm. fixed slower if people hadn't tweeted about it. But that was, you know, last Monday, someone tweeted, well, I'm using, uh, you know, my new dongle with my, um, you know, my my old headphones. And, or maybe it was just the new headphones. I can't remember, but they, they were listening to music. The music stopped, the phone rang. They were unable to answer the phone. Um, yep. And guess it timed out or something, and that you you couldn't also use the volume controls through the dongle, and now that's been fixed. So you know, yeah. in, in the sense, it's like if those people had just you know, oh, keep quiet, don't say anything, then it might not have been fixed. Who knows? I, I completely agree with that. Like, so I was talking earlier about using the Apple Pencil, right, for navigation. In iOS nine point three, they throughout the whole beta period, there was five betas. They removed the ability for iOS to control user navigation. And this was something that I was talking about a lot. And then as it was coming towards release, well, I kind of really drew it into it. I was talking to some journalists, friends of mine, and kind of a little bit of fuss got kicked up about it. And then Apple changed. They, they released a statement and said, oh, no, we're going to make sure that this works as it did before in 9.3. I feel like that there is the requirement for some people to talk about this stuff, to get the word out, to kind of see how people feel about it. And Apple can take that as a way to move things forward. Apple have their own bug reporting system, and that is definitely a way to get feedback to them. And I raised that feedback to them immediately, but nothing changed. A lot of the time to move the, move the needle of a company like that, they need to see that there is actually the requirement within the public to have some kind of change. At least that's my view on it anyway. But I, I don't consider myself a sensationalist person I mean, most of the things that I find and talk about, I talk about on podcasts. And I think we all know this. It's difficult to have a podcast go truly viral. You know, if, if uh, I would write about these things or put them in YouTube videos if what I was trying to do was to drive the maximum amount of attention to them. But I don't. I talk about them amongst my audiences. But our audience and the audience of this show, they're a very vocal audience when it comes to Apple stuff. And they're one that they listen to. So I think it's important. Because otherwise, all I would be doing for a living... It's just being a cheerleader, and I don't think of myself that way. I agree. I mean, I think that, um, it, yeah, I, I think that that's the the joy of podcasting. Like, you can say whatever you want for hours and hours and hours, but if you, you might have just said one thing that someone <laughs> decides is offensive, they can write about it, then it goes viral. So somebody has to write <laughs> about it, and so, yeah, it's true. Yeah, it has to be written about. If it's not on a blog, it doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, what we were just talking about, if you have problems with the, your headphone jack, um, try upgrading. You should, you should update anyway to 10.0.2 if you're just using the regular version um, to uh, update. And you might fix, you probably will fix your audio controls. And then there's some other fixes to 10.0.2. So get that. Um, are yeah, you, you running it. the beta on your phone or are you running um, just the regular iOS 10? <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't usually put something like a 10.1 beta on my phone because usually it's like bug fixes or whatever. But the portrait mode, uh, I wanted that. I wanted to try that out. So I put the 10.1 beta on immediately. And have you had any problems with it? No, I haven't. But I won't, you know, I just say to everybody out there, don't rush to install it. There is a public beta version, but I've heard some friends of mine who've had some problems with some apps that they use not launching. It's still a beta, uh, but I have found it to be very stable. It feels like m mostly this 10.1 beta includes some bug fixes and the portrait mode on the phone. But uh, you've got to take the usual warning of installing a beta that there are some things that may break because the developers of your favorite apps might not have gotten around to fixing a bug that is now in this beta. Mm -hmm. uh, so one other warning, um, don't try to drill a headphone jack into your oh. phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, this this is the type of stuff that I'm talking about, right? With like this industry of people that all they're trying to do is create some sensationalism to get YouTube revenue. 
come through. I mean, this is a terrible story. Uh, I think we can, yeah, what, this is Tech Racks, who unfortunately I'm familiar with because I happen to have two uh, 11-year-old boys in my house who enjoy watching um, iPhones be destroyed, even though I've told them again and again that uh, I don't support this. <laughs> the watching <laughs> Your mother of does it. not condone this. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, he's a super popular... Um, YouTuber, and he said that uh, you know he could you you don't you can just drill uh, into your iPhone to make a headphone jack, and I mean I'm impressed that he got the you know exact perfect drill because it actually fits in there. He um, he puts the is it two two and a quarter inch? What's the headphone? It's three and a quarter inch. What are those? It's three. I think. Three and a, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, he puts it in there and then he plays music. I don't know if we can listen, but it's obviously not working. <laughs> this is see, the thing that upsets me about this. Song, and you enjoy the music. <laughs> All right, that's enough of Tech Rex. <laughs> what what you were know, you gonna say? I don't know what this guy's intention was. Um, maybe he was just trying to create a viral video. I'd like to think that it wasn't, his desire to get people to destroy their phones. But it's upsetting because it, you know, there are people out there that believe this to be true. They've seen the video footage, right? Mm -hmm. How could it not be true? And then they take a drill to their new phone and destroy it. And, and I can pretty much guarantee that it wouldn't be easy to get that fixed uh, within your warranty at AppleCare. I find this sort of stuff to be uh, unfortunate, especially, the, you know, the, the destruction of a brand new iPhone, uh, usually I don't I don't like to look at that. Mainly because there are people that really want these things that are very excited about them, and they're struggling to get them because they're sold out. And then you watch like fifty YouTube videos of people just finding new and interesting ways to destroy them. It's uh, it's kind of the worst of consumerism, I think. I agree. I just when I see it because I mean you you see the business model there is okay, you know, you get enough YouTube hits maybe and then you've paid for the iPhone. I guess I mean I don't think is someone sending that how does this work? Is someone sending them these iPhones? I'm assuming that they buy them and then they make the money back, but it's just like it's, you know, I don't know. It rem, it's it reminds me of say anything where it's like that moment where it's like you don't make anything, you don't you know do anything yeah. like you don't, you know, you just it's like what is that? Like what has the world come to? It's a shame. It is a shame. <laughs> it's 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 just it, it, these things are bad when people are just breaking them. It's worse when then other people then start breaking their phones because they watch that video. This is one of the worst that I've seen because of that. Like the bend gate stuff, the guy was bending the phone, like whatever. If you then see that and decide to bend your own phone, then that's on you because you've seen that it will break. But if you've seen somebody say, oh, just drill a hole in the phone and the headphone jack's hidden inside, th that's a whole different thing. Yeah, so don't do that. <laughs> uh, we had an email from Stan Cook. This is, um, or no, from Bernie from Brisbane, uh, Australia, Brisbane. He said, since upgrading to iOS 10, I've been trying to send messages in iMessage using the new screen effects, uh, but without any luck. Somehow to said to 3D touch the send button to access the bubble and screen effects menu. After countless attempts of trying to do this with no result, I resigned myself to b believing my update had a few bugs. Just today I came across an article on this very problem on how to fix it. Dallas Thomas from wonderhow2.com wrote that if you have reduced motion checked uh, in on, then this would essentially break a lot of these effects. I went to accessibility and turned off reduced motion and hey, presto, the screen effects work. So this, yeah, this was a common problem. I think people are figuring this out, but in accessibility, reduced motion is basically for people that um, have trouble with looking at some of the effects, right? Is that what reduced motion for if it bothers you when you're looking at some of the, the ways apps move around and such? Yeah, when Apple kind of redesigned iOS of iOS 7, they changed a lot of the animations and it became a lot of zooming in and out of folders and applications. And it turned out that for people that had uh, sensitive vertigo, this could cause them to feel uneasy when using the phone. So they added a reduced motion effect. So what it will do, instead of the zooming in and out of applications and folders, things just get a nice kind of swipe. They get like a, a, a Star Wars-esque swipe across the screen as it, you know, transition from your app to the to the home screen. Now, it's turned out that Apple have also included these motion effects 
like the reduce motion has changed the iMessage effects. And these are like the making the message go really large or sending confetti or lasers or fireworks. So that had been taken out. And if you were using reduce motion, you couldn't use these effects or see them. And when someone would send one to you, it just had the little in brackets sent with fireworks, the same as it will say uh, on the Mac. Now, uh, something that's popped up in the 10.1 beta, and I don't know if we'll be able to, to see this on the screen here. There is a, a new setting to when you turn on reduce motion, oh. you get an extra box which says autoplay message effects. Currently, that doesn't do anything. So it looks like it might be a placeholder for the for a final for a final release of allowing people to turn on reduce motion and turn on the ability to play the message effects. But right now that doesn't do it hasn't changed anything. But that's not um, that's not an abnormal thing for there to be a setting appear in the settings app which isn't plugged in yet. They've kind of just built the UI in and then they finish the code later before release. So it'll be worth kind of keeping an eye on this as the betas go through before 10.1 is released to everybody. But that may be that Apple are going to let you have the ability to turn on reduced motion, but then also use message effects when right now you can't. Oh, that's a good tip. Yeah, so lasers and confetti for everyone um, at some Hopefully. point in the future. Are you using a lot of lasers and confetti and balloons and shooting stars? Too many, <laughs> too many. I am obsessed with stickers. I stickers in iMessage is one of my favorite things. I mean, I have a history of stickers on all of my Apple products. I am a sticker person uh, and I have been very, very happy with a lot of the sticker packs that are out and available right now. Yeah, I was super excited because I um, I love being able to just put them on old messages and, and did you know you can pinch and zoom them? You probably already know that, but... Um... I found that out like maybe a day or two ago <laughs> and, and I, I was so excited. I had no idea. I don't know how I missed it. Yeah. But it was only like a day or two ago, somebody sent me a sticker at like a different orientation. It was kind of like rotate. And I was like, hang on a second. And then I kind of put my second finger on the screen and zoomed in and out and was very excited because now all of the times when I've tried to put a beard on somebody's face, like a beard <laughs> sticker on someone's face and it didn't fit, now I can make it fit, which right. makes me very happy. Um, what's your favorite sticker pack? Do you have a favorite sticker pack? Ooh, it changes a lot. Mm. There's, um, there's one called Hipster. Oh. which I have quite an affinity for because it's just lots of uh, basically vinyl turntables and bow ties and big glasses like I wear. And there's a character in there with a beard and glasses. And uh, it looks kind of like me. So I keep sending that one to people. And it also <laughs> has like top hats and things like that, which you can put on people and mustaches. So I'm very happy with the hipster, uh, with the hipster pack. Oh, is it hipster fashion or no? Hipster. No, it is. It's... There's now a bunch of them, which oh. is a which is an issue. I think this one is just called. It just says hipster in my messages right now. Okay. So the problem with then the names change, but uh, yeah, I like that one an awful. Was it free or ninety nine cents? That's it on the the one right in the middle. Right well, there, the, there's you. There it is. That's <laughs> me. See, it looks looks just like me. Okay, excellent. <laughs> All right. Uh, after the break, we are going to have our favorite apps. Do you have a cap? Oh, I do indeed. Okay, all right. Get your cap ready. Um, I have my cap ready. I have my favorite app. You have your favorite app. But first, I want to thank uh, one of our favorite services and our favorite sponsors, Gazelle, especially our favorite at this time when we're buying and wanting to get rid of our old phones and iPads. Uh, Gazelle uh, is the sponsor of iOS Today. You can trade in your old devices for cash, buy a certified pre-owned one, or do both. For trade-ins, all you have to do is go to gazelle.com, find your device, and get an instant quote. Shipping is free, and you get paid really fast. If you're looking to buy a certified pre-owned device, Gazelle has a variety of phones, of iPhones, including the iPhone 6S and the 6S Plus, iPads, even Samsung Galaxy phones. Each device is fully inspected, backed by a 30-day return policy, and sold without a carrier contract. All you have to do uh, is to get financing from a firm. Now all you have to do is provide your basic information. You can get instantly improved and pay off in either three, six, or 12 months. Just select financing with a firm at checkout. Don't miss out on getting the best value on certified pre-owned devices. Go to gazelle.com. 
Com. Devices are available in good and excellent condition. Good condition shows some gentle signs of wear and tear, but offers consumers great prices on still great devices. All devices have been put through a rigorous 30-point inspection process, ensuring that they are in perfect working order. Devices are available for support by all the major carriers, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and Sprint. Give new life to used electronics, trade in for cash, or buy certified pre-owned. Visit gazelle.com today. All righty. I got my cap. This is the time where we uh, wear cap. Oh, nice. Is that a Back, so to, the back to the Future hat? Back to the Future, yeah. Oh. My Back to the Future hat. Do you have the whole costume? Or just I the did once for a Halloween uh, party. I went with the whole thing. I don't have it all now, but I did for a while. I also, I don't think I wore it for Halloween. I wore it to back to, on Back to the Future Day uh, mm. on the screensavers and I had the jacket and it came with like the, the sports pamphlet and everything. So I, I don't know where it is oh, either wow. though. Um, but yeah, so let's talk about your favorite app um, right now. Uh, Narwhal. Oh, yep, there it is. There's, there I that's, am. That's a good jacket. You got the whole jacket. That's good. I got the whole and jacket. The mm -hmm. Perfect. <laughs> and yeah, it didn't come with a t-shirt. I had to find the maroon t-shirt and yeah. Uh, so Reddit, you, uh, what app do you use to, uh, to read your Reddits? So I'm not a, uh, I'm not a big Reddit user. Um, I subscribe to a couple of subreddits and I find the Reddit website to be a very difficult thing to look at. And a lot of the Reddit apps that I've used are full of complicated features for Reddit power users. So looking at things like adding all the gold, stuff I don't understand because I'm not really deep into the Reddit culture. So I found an application called Narwhal, which is ver a very simple, good looking Reddit app. It has a great dark mode that I love. It's great on the iPad. It's great on the iPhone. Um, it's just a really good looking client. You can subscribe to your subreddits really easily as well as kind of just you know log in and, and do everything that you need to do. I like the pay the, the previews that it does of pages. So you'll click on a link and it will show on the on the the right hand side when you're on the iPad. It shows a little preview of the web page that's being linked to and has all of the comments underneath. Um, and you can scroll, you can upvote. It does all of the basic features that you'd want from Reddit. But what I like is is it's just a nice and easy to use application without getting bogged down a lot of the, the craft that some of the other applications, like the official Reddit app or what was Alien Blue before, would I found them just absolutely incomprehensible. Um, and Narwhal does a, does a really, really great job. How do I get to the dark mode? I think it's, I think they have a, um, I think it's in their settings. I think it's part of the paid, because you can pay to remove ads. Oh. And I think, because it's free to download, I believe, and then you pay to remove ads and to get the the dark mode, which oh, I think okay. is uh, on the on the main screen, there's a there's an option for settings, I think, somewhere. Okay. Oh, oh, there it is. You just yeah. hit it. <laughs> I don't think I have the paid version because I still have the ads. But maybe the, maybe the paid version is just to remove ads. Then maybe, yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah, it does look much prettier than the Reddit homepage. Maybe I'll go back yeah. to Reddit. I find it manageable. Oh, sorry. There's my hat. It's, it looks better without my hat in front of it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, my uh, app is a few weeks ago, I um, showed off uh, a bunch of my favorite Bluetooth headphones. And uh, one of them I had just sort of opened. So it was kind of just an unboxing, but I'd used it a couple times. It was the Jabra Sport Pul Pulse. Pulse. Jabra Sport Pulse. Um, and... I said that they were kind of hard to pair as Bluetooth is, but I feel like um, it, all Bluetooth are often hard to pair in the beginning. And then I think it might've been user error. So here are um, the headphones and they uh, they really go in your ear. They're sealed. So the difference between, do you, do, you, um, do you run with headphones, Mike? I can't use those headphones <laughs> that go in my ears. I'm, I'm one of those people, I just can't do it. Earpods do a great job for me still. They, they stay in my ears nicely. Um, or I use over the ear stuff, but the, the in-ear ones, I just can't, I can't do. You don't like things inside your ears? I can't do it. No, no, it just doesn't, doesn't work for me. <laughs> that's, that's the moment that's going to go viral in this. Um, it's going to be a big scandal. <laughs> 
Mike doesn't can't uh, can't use can't use in ears. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I I mean they're sealed in the I have sealed and unsealed. When I am running on the road, I usually don't use sealed. You shouldn't use sealed because then you can't hear anything and car comes up behind you and you have no idea. Um, but they but I do like that they don't fall out because the ear earbuds I can't use those at all. They just always fall out for me. Um, so I really love these um, and they uh, they're one hundred and thirty dollars which is a lot of money, I think, unless you run all the time and find yourself um, really needing them. But what I really like about this is they c it comes with an app also, the Jobber Sport, Jobber Sport app, which I think I have here. Um, and it's an iPhone app. There's probably not a really good reason for you to use it on your iPad. Um, so that's why it's not, it's just for the iPhone. But I love because it'll speak to you and it'll do uh, voice training in your ear, which is awesome. So I've been using it for cross training. You can use it for running and it'll, um, you can do like a, you know, running or walking or cycling and it'll tell you when you've done certain amount of miles. Um, you can do certain training, training settings or the workout. Um, so it has these workouts in it and it tells you how long they'll take. So it's like, if you're going to do the cardio core, it will tell you start your workout and then it does all of these sets. So it'll tell you to start your high knees running and it'll tell you to rest It'll, you know, and then you'll go on to the next one and it, uh, you know, it measures your heart rate in ear, which isn't exactly the same as my heart rate in my Apple watch. So I'm not sure which is more accurate. Mm. Um, do you happen to know if ear in ear? I have heart no rate? idea. <laughs> I've never heard of ear heart rate measurement. Yeah. I, I, but I think that that's sort of what we're hearing with the future. Like, haven't you heard that's what like the, um, the earbuds and that sort of thing, that's going to be the future of measuring all kinds of things through our ear. Oh, I don't even want to think about it. I know. You, this, you might have to eventually stick things in your ear, Mike. I'm sorry to say. Uh. <laughs> uh, but I think, um, what else can I show you? And it you know, keeps a record of all of your training. And it'll also do the Cooper test, which is somehow telling um, your endurance capability, which is great. So I really like this because that's what I've missed in the Apple Watch. Just the voice training. Like I want it to tell me more stuff. Like I love using the Apple watch and it, you know, will tell me how far I've run, but it never speaks to me um, while I'm using it. And this does, and that's nice. So, <laughs> so Jabra Sport Pulse and the app is free, but the headphones are not. They're $130. Mike, thank you so much for coming on. I know we went a little long, so sorry if we kept you from... Happy. <laughs> all your other podcasts. So go to Relay FM and check out all of his podcasts. Um, is there anything else that you're working on that we should know about? Not right now, um, but I'm, I've always got something going on. So uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm uh, at iMike, I-M-Y-K-E there. All right. And you have any products that you're going to be reviewing anytime soon? Um. I'm not, but on uh, we're recording Connected tomorrow and my co-host Federico, he just got a pair of the Beats, I think they're called the Solo 3, the oh. ones that have the new Apple W1 chip in. So uh, I'm really intrigued to see what he thinks of those because they do the whole magical pairing that the AirPods do. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about that. So you can tune in to Connected at Relay FM. And they're uh, a little the bit cheaper, one. right? Aren't they a little bit cheaper than the AirPods? Um, the these are the ones that go over the ears. Oh. So no, they're not. Um, even the the Beats X, they're like a dollar cheaper. <laughs> the ones that the new cheap ones that goes in the ears, they're, they're like they're cheaper, but only by a dollar. So I don't think it's that much of a difference. Huh. Um, and also, if you want to know every last thing about iOS uh, 10, read Federico's review because oh, it's yeah, it's a no, it's not his exhaustive novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exhaustive novel length reviews, and uh, yeah, he works so hard, and I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And Mike, thank you so much. So yeah, go follow Mike, go to Relay FM, subscribe to all of his podcasts, and um, we'll see you again soon. We will. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. <laughs> And thank you for coming on. Uh, if you want to email me, I'm Megan at twit.tv. I always love your emails. I'm at Megan Maroney on Twitter. You can tweet at me if I missed anything, if I messed up on anything, if there's anything, you, any other questions that we can answer, um, you can email me there. And we record iOS Today every Monday around 12.30 Pacific time. And next week, uh, our guests will be Andy and Atko. So thanks for joining us. See you next week. Bye.